Hi, my name is Sylvia Gorajek and this is another episode of Valley Talks. We are here at Runway Incubator in the center of San Francisco and I'm very excited to welcome our special guest, Mark Howitson, attorney at law and former deputy general counsel at Facebook. Mark represented Facebook in the famous lawsuits that served as a plot for the well-known The Social Network movie and he gives advice to companies on all legal issues. Today we're going to talk about risks, challenges and things to pay attention to when running a startup. Mark, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. The Social Network movie portrays two um, main problems that are pretty likely to happen to most of the startups, which is accusation of stealing of someone's idea or as we call it, a founder drama. Mm -hmm. And let's imagine I'm, I have an idea and I want to start a startup. Mm -hmm. So with my idea, I want to talk about this mm -hmm. with people right. and ask for feedback, maybe look for a co-founder, mm -hmm. you know, collaborators mm -hmm. and hires and mm -hmm. stuff. Is there a way that I can protect my idea when talking to people about this? Well, sure. Um, <clears throat> the principal way that you would protect uh, that's intellectual property, your idea, mm -hmm. the principal way you'd protect it would be um, to keep it secret, right? You don't tell anybody. Yeah, that's the but that's hard. Right. Sure. <laughs> but perhaps there's pieces of it that you don't have to disclose. So you don't have to tell everybody everything. That's the first thing. So you have to make a judgment about what are you going to disclose to the people that you're talking to. Maybe you don't have to disclose certain things to a potential hire that you might have to disclose to an investor. Mm -hmm. So you have to think a little bit about what you're talking to these people about. Beyond that, in all circumstances, you should have everyone you're going to disclose your idea to sign a non-disclosure agreement. Mm -hmm. It's a fairly simple contract. You can find them on the internet. Just about any non-disclosure agreement you find at random is better than none. Nothing. Uh, in theory, a verbal non-disclosure agreement might be okay, but very hard to prove that. person said, I never signed anything. I never promised to keep it secret. That's the issue, right? So what you want to try to do is use a non-disclosure agreement and then before you disclose anything, you uh, make the person sign it and then you have to keep it. So that beyond just having them sign it, you have to be able to keep it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems that startups often have is they don't have any record keeping system. Uh -huh. So four years later, when there's a dispute about whether or not they stole the idea, lawyer says, sure, you, you had them sign the non-disclosure agreement. Can you give it to me? I don't have it anymore. Or maybe I had it, but it's on a hard drive that's now long since gone. So. There's sort of the three parts, be careful what you say in the first instance, sign a non-disclosure agreement, and then keep a track of where it is. So those are basically the other ideas. Winklevoss Brothers uh, sued Facebook for $65 million, um, claiming that Mark Zuckerberg stole their idea. And if they had the non-disclosure agreement signed, would it make any difference? Would it help the brothers at that time? Um, well, first, I don't think it was 65 million. I think they were asking for a lot more than that. More? Oh, yeah. But um, yes and no. I mean, in theory, and this is just in theory, in theory, if the idea that they had developed was indeed the, the idea that Mark Zuckerberg took, then a non disclosure agreement would be useful. But for example, let's assume their idea was for a cab company and he started an apple orchard. A non-disclosure wouldn't make any difference mm -hmm. because he would say, I didn't steal your idea because you were going to make a cab company and I made an orchard. So there, a non-disclosure agreement doesn't make any difference. So if indeed he went and decided to start up a cab company, well, then a non-disclosure agreement might be useful. But that's sort of the point, right? If, if you don't steal the technology, mm -hmm. then the non-disclosure agreement doesn't make sense, if that makes any sense at all. Yes. Yeah, so, so there is another issue with non-disclosure agreements how far or how close is what we do right. to what we heard from someone or the other way around as well, right? Right. Well, it, th that's not easy to determine mm -hmm. and ultimately sometimes a jury has to decide how close it is. But um, in the case of software, for example, you can do things called a code comparison to show that the person actually stole code and used mm -hmm. code from the first company to create the code for the second company. And there's experts that can compare the code and say, this type of correlation would only occur if you were copying. Or it would show, for example, there's only random correlation between the code, so therefore they're not copied. Um, that's one example. Uh, various different ways you can prove similarity in a product, mm -hmm. how it functions, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, or just what do you call it? 
what do your emails say? There's a lot of ways you can prove that the idea was stolen, even though they tweak it, make it look a little different. Um, Cause that's often what happens. They don't just blindly steal it and make the, the thing that they were talking about. They tweak it a little bit and then they claim well, it was my idea. But mm. that's the thing you have to prove that it was a copy rather than show it, you know yeah. what I mean? And they didn't have the NDA signed, did they? They did not. They had nothing like that. So that was even harder. Right. They had no agreement whatsoever to prove that there was an agreement to keep anything they disclosed mm. quiet or confidential. Mm. Whether or not it, that's above and beyond whether or not there was any copying of anything, which there wasn't. But. Since 2013, uh, there is the first to file rule in the United States which means that whoever files for a patent first has the rights to it, as opposed to how it was before the, fails, uh, the first to invent rule, where whoever invented the idea, brought it to the market, had the rights to it. Mm -hmm. And if it was the first to file rule um, valid in 2004, um, would it work in favor for Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook? Uh, I don't think there was really a patent at stake in that case, so uh -huh. it really didn't. Patent law really didn't apply. Mm. I mean, if if indeed there were patents at, at stake, then that it would be a factor. But other factors that impact whether or not a patent is uh, effective would be whether or not somebody else had invented the thing that you're trying to patent or that you did patent before. So if you can show that this device was had been already used you know, 30 years before and had already been invented and so yours isn't very novel, then the patent itself may be invalid. So mm. the first to file isn't the only issue. There's oh. also the validity of what it is you patented or the validity of your patent itself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't really any patent litigation going on in the Winklevoss case. Many founders think that when they have an idea, it's worth already a million dollars. Mm -hmm. or it's worth half of the company, you know, one third of the company value. Sure. Whereas experts and you know the industry says it's actually worth maybe one percent. Right. What is your view on that? All depends on the quality of the thing that you're talking about. Mm. So if I invented cold fusion, that's worth an enormous amount, right? Mm, right. If it, it was scientific invention. Yeah. Imagine I invented the actual cold fusion and it worked. That's an enormous invention for the entire of humankind. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be very valuable. Uh, if I invented a new shoe, that's probably not that great, or a new way to lick a stamp. But if you invented a great disruptive, right. um, not invented, but came up with the right. great disruptive idea for travel industry or sure. anything mm -hmm. like that, right. what do you think in this case? Well, it's always a matter of negotiation between you and whoever it is. Like, mm -hmm. So if you're negotiating with the venture capitalists, they want to get the major as much of the company as possible uh, for as little price, as low a price. The uh, founders want to maintain as much of the company as possible and give up as little and you know, take as much cash in as they can, right? So there, that's where the negotiation comes. Mm -hmm. So for example, you take you know, like a Mark Zuckerberg situation, for example, his uh, Facebook invention was enormously popular and he had the leverage to demand terms that another uh, founder may not have because their invention is not that exciting. Now, uh, the example of the travel industry is no different than any other industry. It's a question of, is it that good that I can negotiate for better terms mm. during a financing? Or is it so good that I really don't even need financing because it's already generating revenue, I'm already profitable, I don't really need outside money, but it could be useful. And so then you're going into a negotiation with a venture capitalist or whoever it is you're trying to get money from in a position of power. And, and those factors may not really relate to how good your invention is. Maybe it's an okay invention, but it's terribly profitable. Well, that's a driver in its, of itself of negotiation terms. Mm -hmm. it, so there's so many different factors that mm -hmm. bear into the actual outcome of what value does this invention have uh, to the company? Is it 5% of its value or 80% of its value? 
I can imagine that many founders, you know, when they come up with this idea and mm. they team up with a co-founder, right. may want to use this as a reason for, let's say, having the majority of the company sure. because they came up with this idea right. and, you know, and it's me and w without this, this wouldn't happen and right. stuff like that. So, but as you're saying, I guess it's pretty much different in any case and it's all a matter of negotiating. It is, yeah. I mean, how much do you, if you're the person, the co-founder who has the idea, then how much do you need this other person to join you to be successful? Mm -hmm. It's hard to imagine how you could be successful as one person, yes. right? So you do need other people and you need people with skill sets that you don't have. Not many of us can do everything that a company needs. Mm -hmm. So yes, it might be a really novel and interesting and wonderful invention, but you can't do it by yourself in all likelihood. So you're going to need to start bringing people in and you need to pay them for their skill and time and effort. Uh, and so that, again, just like I said, is a matter of negotiation. Some people are a better at being flexible and than others are not. And sometimes you get a deal and sometimes you don't. Coming back to my startup scenario. Mm -hmm. um, so I have this idea and I started working on startup, my startup. And it, whether it's just me or maybe even a couple of people in the company, I often need help and people offer help. Mm -hmm. Like my friends, you know, friends of friends. Sure. Uh, and they offer help for free. Sure. Uh, with some small tasks, sometimes with brainstorming different sure. things. And is there any threat in this situation when someone helps me with, you know, even some marketing communication on brainstorming mm -hmm. and stuff that, although they do it for free right now, mm -hmm. they want to claim so, some um, um, paying back when the company sure. grows? Uh, yes, so there's two issues. The first one is in the state of California, there really is no such thing as free. You can't have somebody provide services for free. Mm. You have to pay them wages. Uh, it would be illegal to, to do otherwise. Even small tasks? Even small tasks. Okay. The labor code is written so that you must pay everyone for the work they do, ex and except for two very narrow exceptions. So that's the first thing. I would say in startup world, that rule is honored more in the breach. Nobody seems to follow that rule, but that's the first theoretical issue. The second issue becomes, uh, you know, if you hire somebody and they help create some of what you built, for example, let's, you have a great idea for a website and you hire somebody to help code the website. Well, you want to make sure you document with that person who owns that work. And you want to say the company owns the work that they create. And you want an agreement to say that, because if you don't, they can claim, look, I was just hired to come in and do this, but the understanding was that I owned what I created. I was just going to let you use it. Mm. So you might have a license to use what I wrote, but I own it and I can go sell it and you can't stop me. Hmm. So that's the problem. You want, like the non-disclosure agreement, the agreement that you often have people who perform services for you, it's, um, you know, people call it different things, but I call it a proprietary information agreement. It's like a non-disclosure, but it also adds in language that relates to who owns the intellectual property that the person creates while they're working for you. That's what it does. And it makes it clear that the company owns the intellectual property, not the individual. But so we, sometimes they want to own it or you want to let them keep whatever mm, they create. So that would be different. But yeah. in most cases, that's another agreement you can often find online. And even a randomly picked proprietary information agreement would be better than nothing. So uh, I would still think you should have a lawyer help you with that sort of thing. But if you just can't, then find one on the internet and use it. Um, <clears throat> but that's how you typically do it. You delineate it that way. What, yes. what to do when people approach you and they say, you know what, I think if you did this differently in this and that way, that would be better. So they just stop you randomly and you yeah. offer that. Well, in theory, you shouldn't <laughs> you do that, but, but what can, should I yeah, cause my well, use? What? It's not clear what if they tell you. It's similar to the situation we talked about before. They just told me this thing on the street. They, I, I can do it. Mm. I can use it. Now the problem might be that they say, "Well, that's true. I told you about this idea, and you can use it, but so can I." So the person who came up with this great idea on the street and tells you about this great idea and you use it, well, now they can do it too. So they can also use the idea. Like, mm -hmm. it's not exclusively yours. So that's sort of the problem. I mean, if somebody wants to come and tell me the next idea on how to make cold fusion, and I go do it, well, that's 
too bad for them. They shouldn't have told me their great idea for yeah, cold fusion. But I mean, what if they threaten you that if you don't hire them or pay them money, um, they are going to sue you? Well, uh, one of the beautiful and problematic things about uh, the United States is people sue each other constantly. So mm -hmm. you just think, well, okay, okay deal go with ahead it. and okay. we're going to have to work it out. But if somebody gave me an idea, told me something without any kind of agreement to keep it secret, I don't have to keep it secret. Mm. I can use it. Now, again, they can maybe go use it too. Yes. I can't stop them from using it. But I mean, I heard of situations where mm. people even threaten the other. Sure. That, like... People threaten each other all the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> that doesn't make them right. And I'm not used to it yet. Yeah. It just, okay, threaten. <laughs> you know, it happens. <clears throat> That's why, you know, people, we have a lot of lawyers in this country. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I have a roof over my head because of all those threats. So let's say I found a co-founder mm -hmm. and, you know, it works really great. We understand each other. We're starting to work on the uh, product, you know, the right. business and everything. And oftentimes founders are so into their startup that they really um, don't pay enough attention to the legal things. Right. That's so common. Right. And they feel like, okay, let's do, we can do this next week or next month. We sure. don't have money for this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is not the best situation, uh, right. uh, you know, legal wise. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is the most necessary thing to do and pay attention to before you start working on anything together? Uh, well, I think if you can just get a basic understanding and put it to, on paper somehow, that's mm -hmm. sort of the best start. What's the basic idea of what we're doing? Is this 50-50? Am I, am I 70 -30? What is the deal? And what are you contributing? And what am I contributing? And how are we going to do this? That's sort of the initial stage, maybe before you go to a lawyer where you say, okay, we now have this thing, it's pretty successful, and we need to formalize all this, then you can go to the lawyers who can help you put that into the proper format documents and so forth. But before that, you want to have, okay, well, what's just the basic idea? Write it on a piece of paper. What is our uh, role, right? What do uh, I do? What do you do? How much do I own? How much do you own? What's the, what are the key points in our arrangement? and we want to write them down. Because if we don't, and then let's say we worked on it for two months, and then something doesn't work out, and mm -hmm. we have to split, then mm -hmm. there is a problem, right? Yeah, well, there'd be a dispute over who owns what, and how much, and what were you doing, what were I doing, and who owns the technology, all those things. That, that's, there's those disputes all the time. Um, and so, yeah, and if you just had a piece of paper, mm -hmm. it, it also helps you refresh your recollection. Imagine you work on it for a year and a half, mm -hmm. and then something comes up, and you go, you know, I don't remember what we talked about a year and a half ago. Like, well, we had this piece of paper, remember? Like, oh, okay, that's what we agreed to, uh, because you're busy doing other things. If nothing else, it's just there to help. What do we understand? What are our expectations? It, and it's certainly not meant to be the end-all, beat-all of arrangements. That's not the... That's not really the idea. Ultimately, you'd get there with the help of a lawyer, but it's a good place to start. And if I start working on this uh, business with my co-founder and it's been a couple of months and we have to split, we didn't even you know, sign any, any, any legal documents, like professional documents. Mm -hmm. um, how I, I'm thinking whether vesting would also be as important thing to sign as early as possible so that when someone leaves, it's fairly clear mm -hmm. how much of shares they already vested and they own instead of like, okay, what's, what's your ownership in this? Right. Well, it presumably, I mean, in order for, you have to form a company and then in order mm -hmm. to have these shares that you're talking about, during the formation process, you would have at some point described who gets how much in the way of shares. And that would be, you know, basically controlling and the court would look to, well, what did the parties intend? And if the court saw that, okay, well, they intended to be, if there were three of them, a third, a third, a third, okay, then that's the deal. Was there a vesting arrangement? Well, it doesn't say so anywhere, so maybe there wasn't. So, okay. for, you know, for example, imagine uh, one of the founders puts in a million dollars and another founder just says, well, I'm going to work hard. And one founder says, well, I have this super invention. Well, the one that put the million dollars in, you might imagine, said, well, I put the million dollars in right now. I shouldn't have to vest. Mm. And the person who puts the idea in would say, well, it's my idea. I don't want to vest. And the person who's working hard think, well, your services will be valuable over time. So maybe you do need to vest. Mm. So you can see why it might be different for depending on the role that the person's going to play. I see. Uh, maybe. But in any case, I mean, that's where it begins. What did, the, what did you all agree? Was there, was there, were they supposed to vest? 
Uh, and if the answer is yes, then is there any document that I can look at that'll confirm that? Ultimately, what you'd end up doing is creating a stock plan and having agreements that lay it all out. But in the first instance, what did you all agree to? So that's how that would be. You mentioned free confounders, and that's also a thing that I'm um, also concerned about. So when there are three co-founders and we split evenly, 33.3% mm -hmm. sounds pretty fair. Yeah. But what happens if two or three co-founders decide that they don't want to have the, the third one anymore? That happens all the time. Um, and it depends on the circumstances, of course, but you know, hopefully uh, that there's some understanding about what the arrangement is mm -hmm. and uh, the arrangement may provide what do you do if one of the founders isn't working out. A more formal document would have that provision. And if it doesn't, then there are provisions in the applicable law that say, what do you do if one of the people in a corporation isn't working out anymore? Mm. And sometimes that is in an employment agreement, sometimes it's in the uh, corporation's code, sometimes it's in the formation documents of the company, or sometimes people don't say anything about it and then you just essentially have to negotiate your way out of that situation understanding that if you don't get to a resolution the next step would be go to court and let the judge help figure out who gets what and how do we divide all this up between the three of us i mean i don't think offhand of many successful three-person mm. startup situations there just aren't oh. i mean do you think of any i don't and google's too well Yes, you know? I know some that, yeah, it, there were some troubles along the way. Yeah, well, sure. I mean, that's the majority by, by far in my experience is that when you have three co-founders, eventually one doesn't work out. Maybe it's because they don't get, get tired of the work or it, whatever, but inevitably one will leave mm -hmm. uh, for good reasons or bad or mm. whatever. And it's wise to think about that up front. Yes. But, you know, no one really does. Yeah, but are there any standards in the uh, forming the reason why one of the co-founders would need to be fired? Uh, well, yes. So in the state of California, uh, everyone's presumed to be at will, and at, which means you can be fired at any time for any reason, unless there's something new, some legal reason why they can't be fired. So for example, you can't say, well, I don't like the, that founder and I want to fire him because uh, he's over 40. Mm -hmm. or uh, what, one of those other protected classes, you know. Uh, you know there, there's illegal reasons. You can't fire people for illegal reasons, but in general, the person's at will, and unless there's an agreement to the contrary, and they're just an employee, the company has the right to say, you need to leave, I'm not working here anymore. Because I heard of some agreements where it was clearly, as, you know, it was clearly saying that unless it's a major... Um, Unless it's a major problem to the company that this person is causing, you know, not working, right. not doing their um, tasks, or or just being, you know, having some criminal situation, sure. it's it's only these cases that the co-founders can fire the other one. Is it pretty common here, or? Well, so there would be two things. One is like, and it's not uncommon at all in an employment arrangement for the executives, the senior people at mm. a startup that have a provision in their employment agreement that says they can only be fired for cause. And what you just described... That's common be, or not common? Uh, it's pretty typical. Common, I wouldn't yeah. say it's every agreement, but yeah. it's not uncommon to have the first people have a provision that says, mm -hmm. you can't fire me unless you have cause. And cause can be defined as, I commit a crime, I steal from the company, those sorts of things. And if you fire me without cause, then you owe me this, which would be you know six months of severance, investing acceleration, and that mm. sort of thing. Now... Sometimes you'd have an agreement that you can't fire me at all unless you have cause. Okay, well then it's just a matter of, well, what is the price of the breach of contract? So if you're the employee and I'm the company and you have a provision that says you can only be fired for cause and I walk in and I say you're fired, okay, well now I've breached the contract. Okay, what are your damages? What is it going to cost you as a result of my decision to fire you? What's it going to cost you to find another job? You know, that is essentially mm. the price that the company has to pay for that breach. Yeah. Uh, but most of the time, if you see that language, it relates to uh, you can only fire me with cause, cause is defined, and then there's usually a built-in sort of formula for what severance, if you will, I get mm -hmm. if, uh, if I get fired without cause. 
if that makes sense. Yeah, so it sounds like probably this is the best situation to protect you know, uh, yourself when you are teaming up with those two other co-founders in the three co-founders. Yeah, it could situation. be. I mean, there's other pieces to the puzzle, but one piece is the employment piece, but the other piece to the founder puzzle would be what are their um, uh, rights uh, to equity in the company? So, for example, if all mm. three of a, if three people form a company together and they're all all three of us sort of thought up this great idea, and we put the idea in the company. Well, there should be an agreement about what happens if I end up getting kicked out or I want to leave. Mm. What is the deal if I want to leave? Like, what happens to my ownership interest in the idea that the company is founded around? And you want that specified in the agreement, and that's not uncommon. Uh, when you start a, a, a company that you have some sort of agreement with the founders about yeah. who gets what in the yeah. end one of them leaves. Okay, normally I thought it says that whatever you bring to the company and you work on during being in the company, it's all done. It's all in the company. Isn't it like this? Uh, yeah, that would typically be what happens, mm -hmm. yeah. And they would get, you know, some ownership interest in the company yeah. as a result of putting in the idea or whatever it is they put in. Mm. Sometimes it's capital, mm. you know, but yeah, and they would presumably maintain some ownership rights, but not necessarily. One of the ways to take away power from someone in the company, mm -hmm. um, to what I understand, is to issue more shares mm. and allocate them to everyone else and not only not to that person. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was also one of the accusations or or the main accusation that um, Eduardo Severin had towards uh, mm -hmm. Mark Zuckerberg right. and Facebook, that, uh, that this is what happened. And is this a real threat uh, to founders, that the other founders would do something like this? And probably this is mostly the threat that may happen to those that have the smaller amount in the company. Yeah. Is it so? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of different laws that sort of apply to the situation. You're, as a majority shareholder or the large shareholders really aren't supposed to gang up on the minority shareholders. Mm -hmm. That's a general principle, right? So you can't have the, right, so, but that would be an but example. But they are not supposed to, but is it legal or not? Uh, generally, well, it's not exactly that simple. So for example, let's imagine that the company says, we need to get financing. If we don't get money in, we're going to close. Mm -hmm. So they go, all right, well, we have to make a decision as a board of directors of the company to take money in. And if we take money in, we're going to have to give equity out mm -hmm. and that's going to dilute everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. So as long as everybody is equally and fairly diluted, so to speak, then that's OK. Yeah. But you can't do it in such a way that targets that minority shareholder. You can't do that. You mean it's illegal? Uh, yeah. And generally, you can't intentionally try to dilute and right. target uh, individuals. But the allegation that Mr. Saverin made was slightly different. He was saying that, uh, you know, he was fraudulently induced to sign an agreement because mm -hmm. he wasn't told about all the different dilution of situations that were going to happen at the company immediately after. After signing this agreement. Right, right. Now, the, that issue was never resolved by the court to determine whether or not he was right or uh -huh. Facebook was right. So we'll never know. But, yeah. um, but, you know, that's just how it works. The person who is the minority shareholder would claim what you did to me was illegal and the majority's shareholders say, well, we were just acting in the best interest of the company and we all got hurt and maybe you got hurt a little differently because you're, you're a minority shareholder, but we all had to take in the money, otherwise mm. the company would fold. Or we had to make this decision or that decision. So there's a lot more dispute about what was going on than it seems. But in just a general principle, the majority shareholders can't gang up on the minority. Yeah, and also even the mi mi minority shareholder um, needs to sign documents that are um, that are agreeing to um, uh, the is issue of shares. Um, Do they need depends. to be aware of it? They don't necessarily have to agree to it, but they mm -hmm. might be obligated. But they might be um, aware of meetings, board meetings, and uh, shareholders meetings that relate to um, yes. material changes at the company. Mm -hmm. So um, they may you know, they may need to be given notice in some cases of what's mm. going on. But if they're a minority shareholder, their votes may not matter that much. Yes, so. exactly. And this can also happen actually when co-founders split after, after you know, a couple mm -hmm. years of working on the company mm -hmm. or whatever time, and they don't talk to, to each other anymore. Right. And so the 
the existing uh, founders right. or founder can issue stock and they can dilute the, the one that is out there and without his awareness actually, right? Uh, well, it sort of depends. You know, typically those large transactions where you're bringing in money and financing, you do end up having to make disclosures to the people at the company, the, the shareholders. Uh, I mean, that's uh, like required. Uh, in some cases, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, but in others, for example, you know, if the board has uh, you know, essentially authorized a pool of shares that's uh, sort of in the company treasury to be given out to employees when they get hired as stock option grants, those don't, you don't have to notify people about that. That mm -hmm. just happens. Mm -hmm. So it sort of depends on the circumstances. But mm -hmm. you know, material transactions at the company, you generally have to let people know what's going on. In the early days of a company and a startup, um, founders often feel so protective of their idea, idea that um, not only they want to sign NDAs with whomever, whomever they speak to, mm. but also they feel the urge to file for patents sure. fairly early, mm -hmm. where when they don't really have you know budgets for it and stuff like that, right. they still still spend money on it thinking that when they do this, they can protect themselves that the competitors wouldn't introduce this product mm -hmm. or the idea, or if right. they do, they would, they would need to stop, uh, quickly stop mm -hmm. doing this because mm -hmm. they filed the patent, right. right? Right. But isn't it in real life that those patents are actually mostly helpful only when you end up in court? that you can't stop someone to be doing this unless you know you really go to the court and you sue each other and, and things like that. Not necessarily. Um, what, what, what can happen is uh, you, know, you've, you have this great idea and it is patentable and you patent it, mm -hmm. right? And then someone, it turns out, is doing That's the, same, the same, same thing. Yeah, like with you know right. software apps, this happens sure. all the time. That's super easy to... Sure. And so what typically happens is if I'm the patent holder, I send a letter to the person who's doing the thing okay. that I, I patented and I say, hey, I noticed you're doing the thing that I patented. Either knock it off or I can negotiate a royalty or a fee so you can pay me for the right to mm. use my patent. That's what happens a lot. Okay. And so there's some people that are just they own patents and they collect fees from the people who want to do what their mm. patent protects. So that's how patents work. It's like I have a monopoly on this thing. And if you want to do this thing, you have to pay me or you just can't do it. And so that's what you do. So do you ultimately have to go to court? You could if you're the patent holder and somebody's doing the thing on the patent and they won't pay you what you think you should be paid. You can take them to court and say, Your Honor, they won't pay me. I want you to make them pay me. Mm. Or they're not offering to pay me what's fair. Make them pay me what's fair. But I would say majority of uh, cases get resolved. They don't necessarily end up in court. Mm -hmm. But it's a fairly common thing. You know, if you have a patent on something, you, you have to pay for a royalty. Mm. If you want to use something that's patented, you have to pay to use it or do it differently. Yeah. Well, when it comes to you know mobile apps, it's 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 hard because all. So many of these apps are using partially, mm -hmm. you know, something that I patented and, mm -hmm. and, you know, when you do a disruptive messenger, mm -hmm. um, like I had the idea for, mm -hmm. and I was so, um, so scared that someone would do something mm -hmm. similar, maybe mm -hmm. not exactly the same. So mm -hmm. I wanted really to patent this so right. that I have the right to it. But sometimes, you know, patent lawyers say, well, you are, it's, it's good that you want to file the patent, but actually you're not protected so that no one else can do something similar to right. what you're doing. Right. If they could tweak it in such a way that just a minor change yeah. in how you do it is no longer covered by the patent anymore. Mm. But that's where it gets expensive. Then you have to revisit the patent and expand it and modify different things so that it's trying to cover different ways of doing the same thing. Yeah, so, you know, there is this question whether to file for the patent when you're so young and, you know, you don't have any budgets or whether wait uh, wait a longer time because it, you know, it protects you but not really, you know, in the way probably that you would want. And right. Well, that's yeah. exactly right. The dilemma that and no one has the right there. answer to. Nope. You just have to make your business decision about what you think is right. Yeah. and. That would might be the first time you make that business decision, but if the company <laughs> keeps going, you're gonna to have to keep making it. Yeah. So. All right. Um, in the end, Mark, I need to ask you, uh, how close uh, was the social network movie to the facts that were really 
uh, happening uh, when it comes to forming Facebook and when it comes to the lawsuits that were taking place? Uh, my opinion is it was a really nice, funny piece of fiction. Uh huh. Uh, I agree with what Mark Zuckerberg said that they got his uh, clothing right, and just about everything <laughs> else was fictionalized and amusing. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. No, I don't uh, feel like there's a heck of a lot of similarity to the reality that I became aware of. But uh -huh. it was an amusing movie. Because there was also you in the movie as well, uh, uh, portrayed. Uh, How do you see yourself? I don't know if I'm in the movie <laughs> okay. uh, at all, really. No, they, they fictionalized pretty much everything in that. Uh, but it was a fun movie. I enjoyed watching it. I think I've watched it a couple times. Uh -huh. but, uh, well, it's, me too. It's for uh, Hollywood. It doesn't really work that way. Uh -huh. So. And when it comes to the information on the internet, that's also something not really close to what was no, real. No, I would, I, you know, there's so much information in the internet that's just, just bullshit. So uh -huh. very little do I read that I actually give a lot of credibility mm. to. But Mark is not fighting with this. Oh, I don't think he... He bothers. What he says, and I believe him completely, is he doesn't focus on it anymore. Uh -huh. He didn't focus on it that much then. His job is to innovate and build this company, and that takes an enormous amount of time and attention, I'm sure. I don't... Mm -hmm. I don't doubt him at all when he says, I don't really focus on that. And plus, the stuff with the Winklevoss case has been you know, years in the past. And mm -hmm. still, you know, these are things that happen, right? They may not really happen this way to Mark and Facebook, right. but they are pretty common, I think. The disputes and the situations yeah. that the Facebook faced are not terribly unusual. They were just magnified by the success of the company. Of course. And the public... Uh, position that Mark holds mm -hmm. then and now. Mark, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. And I believe that our chat is very useful to many founders out there. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks yeah. very much. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. Thanks.